I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Now is the time to embrace a new wave of workers. Every day, your team grows younger, more digital, and more drawn to entirely new ways of working, which means you need flexible solutions to connect them where business gets done. T-Mobile for Business was born digital. With America's largest 5G network, we can make it easier to work together from virtually anywhere. Your team may be changing, but with the right tech, it can be more productive than ever before. Get started at tmobile.com slash now. This guest has sold so far over 100 million copies of his books. He's a thriller writer, he's a suspense writer. Uh, his latest book, The Ghost Orchid, an Alex Delaware novel, just came out, Jonathan Kellerman. And I have to say, this book was riveting from the beginning to the end. You don't have to read any of his prior books to, to get completely what's happening. It's about a psychologist who also likes to solve crimes. And Jonathan Kellerman himself was a psychologist, had a whole career in that that he left behind when he started writing. So we talk about everything from how to write a thriller to his career and the hard stuff along the way and so much more. Great conversation, great book. Here's Jonathan Kellerman. This isn't your average business podcast and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Jonathan, I love the living room background there. That's a real background, right? That's my office. Wow, that it's, is a that's great That's actually office. my office. When when we bought the house, I, I built myself a nice office. <laughs> I have an okay office, but my books yeah. are a mess. Like, I've got to Like, it really looks professional when you have, like, a bookcase <laughs> like that behind yeah. you. I mean, well, even though, like, some of those books, like, the brown books are just, like, antiques, right? They're not... You don't Actually, go to the bathroom and read those books. Th this is going to sound terrible, but every book you see is a book, is a book or a translation of a book that I've written. These are all my my books because I've written sixty books. So these are all, and the publishers used to give me leather bound copies when a book came out. Now they've cheaped out because that's publishing now. So uh, yeah, it's, that's it's funny all... because <laughs> even though you make you clearly make them a lot of money, like oh yeah. You, 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 I mean, you've sold 80 million copies of books, some crazy probably number like that. Probably more, probably more. I, oh, probably close to 100 million at this point. 
but I mean, they're always bemoaning the fact. <laughs> I mean, this is like a really naive question. And then I want to get into your latest book and, and, yeah. and writing in general, but, yeah. uh, how does it feel? <laughs> Again, this is like a dumb question, but how does it feel knowing that 80 million people more or less, or hundred million people more or less have read something you've written? Well, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's actually 80 million because it's a lot of books. So, oh yeah. So people have read like the whole so maybe Alex Delaware series. You know, yeah. Maybe millions of people. I mean, I don't, it's kind of cool. I never really think about stuff like that. I, I don't introspect and I, I just kind of concentrated on writing books, but it's, it's just nice to be appreciated. It, it shocks me because I never thought this was going to be my job. I think that's like a wonderful thing for any writer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've written a bunch of books. Some of them have been bestsellers, but it's never been, it's not a career. I mean, it's, it's never been a living for me. Like I love writing, but it's never made enough to, to be a living for me. And you know, like one or two books out of 20 will do surprisingly well and you make some money, yeah. but it's not like I could, I could live off of it, but you've been able to, and, and I really admire this. You've been able to just completely switch careers and it was, and you had a great career. You were yeah. like a, a PhD child yeah. psychologist ran departments and were no, no, it's sort of like how J James Patterson was like the head of an ad agency. Like right. that was his life. And right. now nobody knows that they all know him as the, the writer. I, I think a lot of people know I am a psychologist because I write about a psychologist. I, I never thought writing was a serious job. I thought it was something I, that I was addicted to, and I've been writing since the age of nine, and I won writing awards and blah, 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 but I, I was going to be a psychologist. That's what I wanted to do, and I was a medical school professor, and I did some pretty heavy stuff, you know, working with kids with cancer. That was my career. Then I went into private practice when I was 31, and lucked out. We had a huge practice. I had three people working for me. I was really busy. I loved the work. Finally got published in 85, and for five years, I basically had five bestsellers while in full-time practice because I'm so conservative and cautious. First of all, I love what I was doing. I love, uh, you know, clinical psych. It was a great field. Every day you're doing good deeds and you're helping people and kids are fantastic to work with. Very gratifying job. And, I, and also, I just didn't think this writing thing, even though, I mean, my, my first book was bought for small change, okay? But then it was made into a TV movie. Like, did you yeah, make money on that? Yeah, but that's not what did it. It was a okay. bestseller before they made it into a TV. The thing is, it's a, like most businesses, publishing was a business of self-fulfilling self prophecy. And people, and some books are bought as big books. And my book was bought as a small book, which means the publisher wasn't going to put anything into it. They sent me around and I was lucky because I was like the freak of the week, shrink writes novel. So I got a lot of attention and good reviews. Word of mouth became this bestseller. Nobody was more surprised than my publisher. So the advance was so small that I calculated, I got three bucks an hour to write that book, okay? And I said to myself, God, this is so much fun, but I don't know if I can afford to do this because it takes a lot of time and the money sucks. And I, you know, I have kids to support and I love my work. And then it became this bestseller. So I said, okay, I'll try, I'll do another one. It became a bestseller. So, all right, let me do another one. It was a huge bestseller. The third one was on my... So then I'm starting to shake. This is crazy. And, and after five of these books, I start to taper down in my practice. I was willing to accept the fact that this might work. And to my utter shock, I've been doing this for 40 years. And it's, it's crazy. I, I, I don't understand it because I never write commercially. Never. I never set out to write a bestseller. I write what I want to write. And enough people like it that I'm lucky. I think. And and you know an important concept just in terms of like yeah. the grit aspect of this. You yeah. you you didn't quit your day job. You know how people say they read someone's first novel is like, man, don't quit your day job. Right. You didn't quit your day job. No. You were trying to mitigate the risk. You had a family to support, and exactly. and you know that's a very people people think entrepreneurs take risks, and, and to, a writer has a very similar mindset to an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, it's all about risk mitigation because you lose the game if you go broke. A hundred percent. I'm allergic to poverty. Uh, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I don't, I don't like it. And uh, I was doing very well as a psychologist, very comfortable. I, 
I remember uh, when I published my first novel, it was 85, and I was, and I was driving a brand new Jag, beautiful Jaguar. And, and the publicist came out to me. She said, oh, it's a nice car. I said, you see, I don't need you guys. So I was doing fine, and it gave me, I think, a psychological edge. Not yeah. that I was snotty, but I could take a more mature attitude toward it. But you're right. It's just I, I'm risk averse. I'm not stodgy. I'll invest. I'll do things. You know, if you invest enough, you're going to win mostly, hopefully, and, and you're going to lose some. Hopefully, sure. you, you know, you can't not move and do anything. But I just love to write, and I'm just grateful. It's just the greatest job in the world. How long it'll last? I don't know. It's lasted for a long time, and I keep going. I'm almost 75 years old, and I feel good, and my genetics are good. My mom was almost 103 when she passed. So I had a living parent in my 70s. But you never know. So I, I, just, I just take it as it comes. And, and I'm, I'm still shocked by the fact that I've been able to do this and that my wife's been able to do it. I know, your, your wife, your kids. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we'll, it's we'll talk about that because it's very yeah. interesting. And, um, but I, I'm like, before you're, so you were like writing in the garage at night. And, yes. you know, again, there's analogies there to entrepreneurship. You sure. and Steve Jobs had your creativity <laughs> in the garage. Right. The classic garage. But, you know, I'm assuming, and, and I've read in places, you had some novels you had written, you had some rejection before that very first one was accepted. And, oh, yes. And I had 13 years of straight rejection and nasty rejection, not nice rejection. And um, I think I wrote nine novels that didn't get published, deservedly so, but there was no conspiracy to keep me out of publishing. I needed to get good enough, basically. I feel like every writer has been through that, including, again, in my own limited way, myself. It was about 10 years of, or no, sorry, it was also 13 years before yeah. my first, I had a book about finance and then switched to other stuff. But why do you think you stuck with it? Like you had a fulfilling job, you had a family, you had responsibilities and 13 years of rejection. At some point yeah. you got to say to yourself, maybe I'm not good. Maybe this is not for me. I said that many, many times. I quit many, many times. What I learned is that I was addicted to it, uh, which is something a publisher shouldn't know because then they take advantage of you. Uh, but I, I've been writing compulsively since the age of nine. I just love to write. I love books. I love to read. I love to write. I was always the kid who would write other kids' essays for them. I won a bunch of writing awards. It, I won't say it came easy, but I liked it. And it, there was a certain flow, and I was fairly, fairly good at it. So I just like doing it. And in college, I did a lot of it. I, I was a cartoonist for the UCLA Bruin, the paper, for four years. I, was, I did a cartoon a day for four years. You're like Scott Adams or Dilbert. Yeah, exactly. Or, uh... exactly. I mean, I, I love being, I mean, I couldn't get away with the stuff I did now because it's so woke. But, but it, it was a good time to be in college from 66 through 70, 70, 71. And while you get to work on a paper, so then you get to try other things. So I was a columnist. And I did some journalism, and I ended up being an editor. So I was writing, and then I won a Goldwyn Award for for an unpu uh, thankfully un unpublished novel, and that's like usually a stepping stone to film business. Doesn't appeal to me, but I got an agent. I was twenty one, so I thought I was hot stuff. Well, you know, fourteen years later, or thirteen years years later, but of course, you you go through that exactly that you go. I'm spending thousands of hours on this futile thing. Maybe I'm delusional, and and I quit. And I kept coming back and I would quit and kept coming back. So people say, who is your mentor? I say, nobody ever mentored me. I've mentored other people. It was just a guy alone in the effing garage, typing away on a typewriter. This is prior to the days of computers. This is in the, you know, in the 80s, early 80s and 70s and 60s. And, and finally I broke in. And that's why even though they pay me three bucks an hour for, for when the pow breaks, I said, I'm no longer a delusional schizophrenic. I am a writer. I am the real deal now. I am a novelist. If nothing else happens, I made that. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's I just love doing it, and I'm driven to do it. But I'm also able to, you know, to take a break. I don't. I'm not crazy about it. I, and I have a measured approach to it. Were, were your initial attempts at novels were they all in the thriller suspense space or did you did you no. try other genres or literary or what what's i put literary in quotes for anybody <laughs> who's not watching because i find your books to be quite literary actually thank you um thank you. and i think the distinction of genres is a false distinction but of course it is you, you know did did you 
attempt other types of novels while you were sure. in those years? Well, when I was in college, I wrote humor. I wrote satire. So I tried humorous novels, coming of age novels, suspense novels, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't very good at plotting. I was always really good at turning phrases, but not good at plotting. And I didn't have the discipline. Plus, I was too cowardly to write about myself at all, to write about my own experience. After I became a psychologist, I had some life experience. I was in my 30s rather than in my 20s. And I was able to parlay some of that because I had something interesting. I had nothing to say, basically. Uh, and I agree with you about genres. That's that's a mutation of the post-World War II era. Prior to that, I'm thinking about the guys before that. You think, you know, Fitzgerald didn't have a plot, you know? <laughs> Well, even I mean, and even like Nathaniel West wasn't always necessarily considered like a literary novelist. No, and, no, he's like a pulp guy, you know. Yeah, he's a pulp guy. And then you had guys like John Dos Passos, yeah, who was heavily plotted, but was considered a literary guy because he would just simply hang out with Hemingway a lot. You know, Dashiell Hammett. I'm not such a fan. He 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 was part of that gang. I you know I I I don't think his books are that great. I think he's a lightweight compared to Ross McDonald or some of the others. It's, to some extent, that was a figment of knowing the right people. I mean, Hemingway had a plot. People plotted. It's only in the post-war era, I think, there was this anime, there was this angst. That's when abstract expressions, all this stuff came into being. People were, you know, kind of like what's, what's happening now. There's an attempt to deny reality and impose narrative. Uh, narrative is what we write. It's not what they call it. And and so the so we get these books. People would always ask me, they would ask me the same same thing. Gee, you're a good writer. Are you gonna write a literary novel? And I would say, So you want me to write the same book without a plot? It's funny because I actually started off, you know, making notes of what I considered literary sentences, meaning yeah. the analogies were or the things you were saying and describing were in you were to me that what that means is that they were unique. They were told in a unique way Thank that you. maybe I hadn't seen before. Like it wasn't in a cliche way. Like but I felt, I felt like, I wonder what role that uniqueness played in making these bestsellers. Like you mentioned, you weren't good at plot. Obviously, you're excellent at plot now. Yep. Maybe it's the things that you start off bad at that you recognize you're bad at, and you so you make an extra effort to improve. But the, the architecture is quite literary, and then with a the plot. Well, you were extremely insightful because that's exactly what happened. I finally figured out. I said, you know, I have been doing then uh, academic writing, medical writing, and journals where you have to be really structured. In those days, nobody plagiarized, at least I didn't. You have, you have to have your sources. It was a very structured approach. And I think that helped me a little bit. I said, you know, I have to apply some of the same discipline. I have to really learn to plot. So I overcompensated. And when the bow breaks is so heavily plotted, I was then required to do it in subsequent novels. People expected it of me. The irony is nobody remembers plots. They remember characters. but. There was That's this, really this, true. Yeah, nobody remembers plots. I mean, I, but they're important. It's like structuring a house. You you have to have framing before you decorate it. So, but I, I agree with Mamet. I agree with that. This whole thing of characters are separate from story is nonsense. It's all about story. Characters come out in the process of story. And so it's so you need the story first, then you characterize. You can't just have people floating around in the miasma. I think it was P.G. Woodhouse said the kind of book where people sit around talking for 200 pages and then the adolescent doesn't kill himself, you know? It can't relate to that. I, I would say there, there, there is one genre that I call the, the, the MFA genre where you can tell yeah. basically someone got an MFA and then wrote a, a novel about having an affair with their professor. Right. And, right. and, yeah. and then it just sort of ends with, with nothing. Like there's no plot. And that, well, I feel, 100%. is a very unique genre only used by MFA people. Well, it's funny you should say it because one of my editors was a very, um, he, he was a very erudite guy. And he said, John, I can always tell which MFA program they came out of. Yeah, because that's they, interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's a sameness to it. And it's pretentious and it's self-indulgent. So I spent a lot of time plotting, even though nobody will remember the plots. But with, but I do like to play with language. On the other hand, I have to make sure I don't overdo it. Because if you love playing with language, I don't believe less is more. I'm not a minimalist. But I don't think you can just go to extreme and keep hyperbolizing. So there's a, there's a discipline that is required. But basically, I just, I try to read it and see if I like it. I'm a 
you know, I'm a tough critic of writing in general. If I like it, I'm hoping someone else will like it. Well, it, it's interesting. On the one hand, there's the importance of story because yep. people go in there expecting a certain framework where, you know, there's a murder, there's a... Uh, uh, you suspect someone for a long time, then you realize he didn't do it, then you suspect <laughs> somebody else, and right. then boom, there's like amazing gymnastics to to get this <laughs> twist and, and the end. But you're right, like, I mean, I just saw a movie last night, Ip Man. It was like, I, you know, spelled I-P Man. It's like a karate movie or a kung oh, yeah. fu movie. I cannot, at, right now, 24 hours later, I cannot remember the plot at all, but I love <laughs> the character. Love exactly. him. And exactly. So, so it's like they, you need to give the, the excuse to buy, but then the characters, I guess, give the excuse to really love and enjoy the author. Well, think of it in terms of building a house. You have to frame it first. Then you start decorating. To me, the writing is, but there's no house if you just have furniture sitting without walls. You need those walls within which to furnish. And that's how I see it. And us, otherwise, it just floats around. And... um. It's just, it's a crazy business. And some people are going to love what I do. Some people are going to hate what I do. There's nothing I can do to control it. I write the way I write. I try to write as well as possible. I, I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite uh, until I'm happy with it. And I'm, you know, I, I'm not self-critical to the point where I put myself down. But there are days when I walk away from the computer, I go, mm, that was, that was crap. You know? but, you, but you have confidence in your ability yeah. to rewrite. Because like I've you done know, it for so long. Right, yeah. like you know if you write have a bad day, okay, at least you maybe moved a little further in the plot. But what happens exactly. when you get lost in the plot? Or I you, never get lost. I never Do you outline lost. it all out beforehand? Yes, I mean, I And am. that's a, cla a classic question for mystery writers because yeah. I guess you have, I would say Brad Thor, he's the one thriller writer I've spoken to where, again, it's a page turner, but he, he doesn't necessarily have the twist. Like right in the beginning, you yeah. know who the villains are usually like, oh, somebody accidentally is parachuted into Russian territory yeah. and has, so you know who the bad guys are, but, yeah. uh, so I, I forget it, whether he plots it out or not, but for your style, I feel like you got to know where the critical twists are going to be as you start. Well, it's, it's very right. interesting. Uh, my, my friend, John Camp, who writes as John Samford, he uh, writes yeah. books where, where he, he's, he's a wonderful writer and he's a great guy. And, um, he writes books where you know who, who the bad guy is. And despite the fact they're really suspenseful, there's no right or wrong way to do it. I just choose to have a mystery. To me, any good fiction is, is mystery fiction because you want to turn the page. You, right. you have to propel it forward. You have to be at least curious. We just use crime as, as the catalyst gets, gets, yeah, gets people going. In terms of outlining, I just found that's one of the things that I started to do when I felt I was really deficient in plotting. So I said, okay, I'll do what I do for a scientific article. I'll sit and I'll think about it, I'll outline it, I'll be organized, I'll look at the data. And uh, it worked for me. And I know my wife outlines, my son Alex, but Robert B. Parker of Blessed Memory, he claimed he didn't outline. Elmore Leonard, I don't believe outline. Uh, so maybe I'm just not smart enough. But I, the other thing about the outline is, I'll do this outline, and I'm in the middle now of outlining a new book. And then... I'll put it aside and rarely look at it. Then I'll finish the book and it's a whole different book. So, so the, out, so it's, uh, the outline helps give you confidence, I think. And wow, I think that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. So you don't have to stick to it. You no. just, it's, it's maybe like a guiding post, particularly in the beginning. But if something seems like a better twist for you while you're writing, then you just go in that direction. Cause it 100%. seems to me, if you, 100%. if you know everything that's going to happen yeah. as, as the writer, maybe yeah. it's harder to, fool the reader because you know so much about what's going to happen. You don't really know what's going to fool them or not. Well, it, you know what happened? This is going to sound really hokey, but it's really true. The characters become real people who live in your head and they start talking to you and they say, uh, -uh you got me wrong. And, and it's just, it, it just changes. A person I think is going to be a good person because not such a good person and vice versa, show a human side to this guy. And things change, but I think, at least in my experience, my personally, the the outlet has done two things. It gives me confidence. So when I sit down, I at least deludedly think I know what I'm doing, and I never have experienced writer's block. I mean, I never get lost. There's always the muddy middle, but 
But in general, I, I never have a day where I can't write. Uh, the, the whole thing about writer's block, once again, I'll talk about Robert Parker because he was, a, he was a, I don't know whether you ever met him. He was, you know, he no. passed away a few years ago, but he was a crusty guy. Uh, my, my favorite three quotes are Robert's uh, four. I met him in Chicago at this hoity-toity writers conference. And Mr. Parker, what inspires you to write? He goes, I have a contract. So I thought that was great. And when he met me, he, we were talking, he said, you were too smart to come from LA, <laughs> which I thought was really, the other thing he told me, he says, John, you're a professor. I was a professor. Being a professor is bullshit. <laughs> you know? So I, he was just great. Wise so words. Yeah, 100% true. And then when he talks about writer's block, he said, when you call a plumber, does he say I can't come because I have plumber's block? So, you know, you just, it's a job. And uh, I'm not saying anyone who has writer's block is not a good writer. I just have not experienced it, ever, not once. Small business owners are savvy and know how to get maximum value from their monthly business purchases. The Enhanced American Express Business Gold Card is designed to take your business further. It is packed with benefits and features like four times membership rewards points that automatically adapt to your top two eligible spending categories every month on up to $150,000 in purchases per year. So you earn more where your businesses spend the most plus up to $395 in annual statement credits on eligible business purchases at select shipping, food delivery, and retail subscription merchants. So with flexible spending capacity that adapts to your business and access to 24-7 support from a business card specialist, you can continue to run your business with confidence. The Amex Business Gold Card, now smarter and more flexible. It's got the powerful backing of American Express. Enrollment required terms apply. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash businessgoldcard. I am kicking myself because this is back in the 90s. The CFO of a major company asked me if I can create a web dashboard for all the key metrics of his company, like everything from revenues, earnings to specific contracts and specific deals and how each department was doing and so on. I felt like I could have done it, but I didn't really want to do it. So I said, no, NetSuite which did do it around that time and, and started as a company is now a multi multi billion dollar company. And of course they went public and then they were acquired by Oracle and they did a really good job. And I'm so happy that they're sponsoring this podcast. Listen, when a business gets to a certain size, it does start to crack a little bit. You start to see the little cracks, things you used to do in a day are taking a week. You have to look up things manually. You have to ask the right people. You don't have one source of truth. If this is you, you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And again, this is really important. It is so convenient when there's more data than ever about how well a business is doing. And you need to know your numbers if you're going to outpace the competitors or if you're going to succeed at all. NetSuite is that dashboard to do this. It's, it's really key no matter what size your business is. Right now, you should learn what your key metrics are. And so right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist, netsuite.com slash James. I'm fascinated though. I think suspense slash thriller is 
very hard because you, not only do you have to plot in in this, like people expect extra suspense and they expect <laughs> to be fooled. So given right. that they already ex go into this thinking it's like a puzzle to some extent, yeah, like, you know, you go into a novel, let's say any of your novels, or, you know, I could be talking about this one or I could be talking about any, you kind of lead us to believe there's some really annoying guy who's a bad guy, but we also sort of know that because it's the middle of the book only, I, and I'm being kind of led to believe it's probably not true. And so <laughs> it's very well put. So, you know, so I, I, how do you get around that? How do you know that you've got the right twist? I don't know. I just, once it feels right to me, I'd sit down and write it. I, I, I don't introspect. I, I, to me, I always would tell students who would ask about writing, I would say introspection is the, worst enemy of creativity. Don't study your navel. You just got, it's like a job. I talked to Stephen mm. King about this. And any of us who've been doing this for decades have the same approach. It's a job. You don't even say career. It's a job. It's a great job. We sit down. We take it seriously. I don't write in my bathtub, in, in my bathrobe. I get dressed. I shave. I go to the office like I used to when I was a doctor. And I do my job. And, and I just don't think about it. I just try to do it as well as possible. And um, I, I, I just, that's why I think those MFA things where you give other people your stuff and they, it's just a circle jerk. I mean, you know, it's just not something that appeals to me. And I'm glad that I didn't come out of the English department. I came out of a different background. And um, I just don't even think about it. If it feels right to me, if the story is making sense, if it's not, I'll change it. So. As I say, it takes a year for me to write a novel. Half of that time is spent planning and plotting and outline. Half is spent writing. So I put just as much time into it. Once I've done that, once I've prepped it, everything needs to be prepped. You know that. You want to invest in stock. You got to do research. You don't do it blind. I paint a, I paint a picture. I have to prime it. And I'll use different color primers. I have to layer it. Uh, you know, you play music. You have to limber up. Uh, everything requires prepping. What do you mean by layer layer up? When I paint, I people say, "Oh, is it relaxing?" I'll say, "Not the way I do it because I copy old masters. And I'm super realistic, so I use layers and layers of paint." A, a lot of painters know that the underlayer will affect the next layer. So if you put down color A and put down color B, color B looks different than if it wasn't sitting on top of color A. So there's a lot of glazing. There's a lot of that kind of painting requires a lot of precision, a lot of layers. And same thing with writing. You have to just prepare it properly. Uh, some people don't. I mean, Parker did some great books. Elmer Leonard was brilliant. He did an outline, but he did a different type of book. You know, uh, the kind of book, you're 100% right, the kind of book that I write because I've been overcompensating for being a lousy plotter for 40 years already because it's expected of me, which is the other thing. When when my when my son started writing, my wife told him, Faye, Faye said, Jesse, you better write what you want to write because you'll be required to do that the rest of your life. Okay? It, yeah, right. Because if you suddenly wrote, um, you know, uh, Flowers of Algernon or whatever, right. part two, right. like people would right. be like, oh, this is like a, a pet project of his. It's not it's not Alex Delaware. I'm not, exactly. I don't want to read this. You know, I've done some non-Delaware suspense novels, some of which I think are at least as good as the Delawares. And they sell 90% of the Dellers, no matter how good. I, I did a book called The Murderer's Daughter. And my publisher was really excited about it. Great female character. This is going to outsell Dellers. No, same thing. 80, 90% of Deller. And so people want that from me. It doesn't bother me. I'm not like Raymond Chandler sitting around getting drunk and bitching about it. I happen to like writing Dellers. If I didn't, I'd stop. But I'll give well, you another good example. My son and I wrote a couple of, of Golem books. Golem of Polly with the Golem of Paris. We think they're brilliant books. Stephen King freaked out over them. He said, this is, took my breath away. We saw, oh, we did something great. Nobody wanted to read them. Nobody bought them. You know, they, it's just, that's the way it is. People expect a certain thing. But it, it's interesting because you, you're, the first part of your life, you were a great, your career was, you were a great child psychologist. I like and, to think so, yeah. And, you know, your Alex Delaware series, is about this amazing child psychologist right. who also loves, you know, solving crimes. Yeah. <laughs> Most psychologists do. Well, say psychologists, there is an element of 
there's a person in front of me and there's a period of discovery that you have to kind of peel away to find out who this person really is and, and what's driving them. And so when you have a character based on that, it's like that there's a little bit of your autobiography in each book. I feel like you're living inside my head because that's exactly what I used to tell myself. I said, I'm doing detective work. Every time a new patient comes in with some problems, I need to figure out what's going on. It's detective work. So I'm doing detective work and I'm doing it in a certain way. But the other thing is that I did have experience with the criminal justice system. I, I've been an expert witness. I've gone to court. If you, if you see enough patients and you're in enough clinical situations, especially in, it, in an inner city hospital, you're going to have, you're going to see all sorts of crazy stuff. And even in private practice. And so I had experience with that darker side of life. So it, it didn't it, come out of nowhere. You know? Right. And right. I think that is shown so much in these novels, in this Alex Delaware series. So just to set the context, Alex Delaware is a child psychologist and he just lives for helping his partner, you know, Milo <laughs> solve these crimes. And like, I'll just say like in the ghost work, for instance, in the beginning, he's kind of depressed because he hasn't gotten the call from the guy <laughs> right, in a while. Right. Like he just loves this. Exactly. He's addicted to it. And it's not where he makes money. He doesn't make any money. He has a well-paying job doing legal work. He makes a lot of money. He's, he's done investments. He's a successful guy. But this is what he does to keep his brain going. And he is addicted to it. And it's been an issue with his girlfriend, Robin, uh, because he puts himself in danger occasionally. And uh, he's just drawn to it. And I think that uh, a protagonist needs to be driven. I, I never was attracted to apathetic heroes, anti-heroes, guys who didn't give a damn. I think for a book to have drive to it, the protagonist needs to be driven too. Well, what's an example? Like, like well, let's, let me just ask you, like Jack Reacher, he's clearly motivated by doing oh, yeah. justice, but yeah, at the beginning of each novel, it seems like he's apathetic. I don't see him as apathetic. I see him as a drifter. I think Lee's a great writer and created this amazing person with a great assumption of this guy traveling around rural America doing great stuff. Uh, he just is, he's like, to me, Reacher is like a cowboy hero. He's there yeah. when you need him. He's like a good gun that you're ready to shoot when it's necessary. But the the, the other kind of book is like, the cozy novels you used to have from England where there's a body and everyone stands in the drawing room and talks about it. I don't like that. To me, I've seen dead bodies. Dead bodies are upsetting. Violence and crime is upsetting. And, and policemen, cops, they get images in their heads. They can never get rid of those images. I'm, I'm very empathic. I'm a super empath. I don't want to look at this stuff because I know once the it, once the image is in my head, I'll never get it out of there. So that kind of book kind of annoys me when people are, oh, there's a body, let's go have a martini. That Dorothy Sayers and that, um, which is not to detract. Um, right, they have think, their audiences. They have their audiences, and I and look, some of them are really good. Uh, Agatha Christie, most successful mystery writer in the world created these great puzzles, very mathematical, very little, if any, char character developing. Poirot was Poirot in the first book, and he's Poirot in the 10th book. Of the British writers, I like Ruth, Ruth Rendell. I mean, she was a genius. And she also dealt with the uh, dark aspects of the human psyche. And it, crime is bad. Crime is bad stuff. I, I, I don't like an apathetic. For example, the movies are always showing cops making jokes about it and being light lighthearted. There's a certain amount of gallows humor that occurs to mediate their anxiety, but most of the homicide cops that I've met are really, really upset by this stuff. They really take it to heart. They're sensitive guys. I, I find when I talk to homicide cops, I'm a tougher guy than they are when it comes to bad guys. They're more, I don't know, tolerant. It's not tolerant. They're more soft-hearted even than I am. Wonder why that is. Like, because think... they're sensitive human beings. To become a homicide cop, a really good, you have to really care. And when they say, I want to help people, they really mean it. It's not like someone who works for a nonprofit. The guys who, who, who set out to, they become obsessed, the good ones. 
And so that whole thing of they're sitting around and they're making jokes about it, that's a lot of nonsense for the most part. They're very serious guys. I mean, and, I, and women too. When you were a psychologist, like you said, yeah. after seeing so many, like, let's say young people through the system, eventually you're going to yeah. see some horrible stuff, whether it's oh, yeah. abuse or crime or, or kids who can't be helped or kids who are like, you've been involved in kids who are let go, who still need institutional treatment. Sure. And I mean, was that hard to deal with? And in many cases, you might not know the end of the story either. Like someone's in the hospital for a little while, then they're gone and you don't know the end of the story. <laughs> Oh, that happened to me many times. Um, what happened to me is I, I've had stuff thrown at me. I'm, I'm not really good at planning my life. I'm kind of experiential. So I went to grad school to become a psychologist. I got married when I was 22 years old. I got my PhD when I was 24. I looked 18. I grew a mustache because people kept saying, doctor, how old are you? And I was, I was sitting in my office. I was an intern at Children's Hospital. Chief psychologist comes, he goes, John, are you really going to finish your PhD this spring? I said, well, you know what it's like if they accept it. He says, okay, would you like a job here? Children's Hospital is kind of like Yale, Harvard. You know, it's a very, one of the best hospitals in the world. I'm going, hell yeah, I'm 24 years old. I'm married, I'm broke. So yeah, you offer me a job here. Awesome. Then he says, this is the job. I thought it's going to be a straight psych, psych job. No, 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 no. He says, well, you know, we have these kids with cancer, very serious, uh, solid tumors, and we can't give them enough chemotherapy because the chemotherapy kills their immune system and then they die of, pneum of pneumocystis pneumonia. So we have a study from NCI or NIH, whatever. We use these germ-free modules called laminar airflow units that were developed by NASA to decontaminate astronauts. And we can use them but the government is telling the, the oncologist who's doing the study, you can't put kids in isolation without studying psychological aspects. I'm listening to this. I'm 24 years old. I go, okay, and what's my job? Your job is to find out what's going on and to prevent problems. So that was my first job. I had no interest in oncology. I had circulated through other parts of the hospital, but I really didn't want to deal with it. But it was fascinating, and I got paid to think. So I got to say, I got to do research and figure out what was going on. And when I met the guy who was doing the research, he looks at me, also a young guy, but older than me. He's like 33. He, he looks at me, he goes, oh, I guess you'll need an office. So that was the welcome that I got, right? Because in those days, the doctors weren't too psychologically minded. Three years later, he's going around saying, most important data to come out of my study are the psychological data. Because he knew he could not do that study without us. So that was my first job. I didn't think it through. So then people say, oh, you work with kids with cancer. Isn't that depressing? And I said, no, because I know I'm helping them every day. And a lot of them, some of them are getting cured. That's the purpose. That's the point. And, and so three years later, the same guy became the head of oncology. And he said to me, John, can we do for all of our patients what we did for those kids in that unit, which is 3,000 or 4,000 patients? And so I said, I was 27 years old. I said, okay, let's try it. So we were the first people to do psychosocial care. So it's been thrown at me. I never had time to worry about it. I was so busy. And I really felt it was very uplifting, very rewarding. I would leave work every day knowing I'd done something important. And why don't we say that about every job? And the reason I left the hospital in 1981 wasn't because of the patients. It's because I got tired of the bullshit and the bureaucracy. I just got tired of dealing with it and, and not making any money. You know, the salaries are not good. And I have kids. So I went into private practice and I told my wife, and also I wanted to give writing one last shot, which I did many times. And I said, honey, can we tighten our belts? Because I'm not going to make any money for them. Just go into practice. And people said, said to me, 1981, you're giving up a tenured position to go into solo practice during a recession? And I had no knowledge. I said, oh, there was a recession. I didn't live in that world. I didn't have money to invest. I didn't know there was a recession. I went into practice and I figured nothing would happen. Like Arthur Conan Doyle, who had a really bad medical practice, he wrote Sherlock Holmes. I said, I'll have time to, to at least take a year and give writing one last shot. And my practice booked up in two and a half weeks. Wow. So and how was, did you find the time then to write? Yeah, back to the garage at 11 p.m., yeah back to doing what I was doing. And, and finally, four years later, I got published. 
And, uh, but so I just, I'm just not a guy who plans things out. Uh, they say you make your own look. I guess so. If I didn't have a doctorate, I couldn't be a psychologist if I didn't have a license, you know, but, but they offer me jobs. What can I say? You know? Well, yeah, I, I, I think it's true about the, you make your own like, luck, but you have to, you have to eat what you make basically. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like you were offered the job, you took it, you have an opportunity to write a series of, you know, thrillers that have a child psychologist as the main yeah. character. Yeah. So you took yeah. it and that becomes the, the, one of the best selling series of all time. Oh man, I love these sponsors when I wish I had started this company myself. Our friends at ZipRecruiter, they did a recent survey. They found that the top hiring challenge that employers face for 2024 is a lack of qualified candidates. There's nobody out there. Everybody, all the qualified candidates have jobs already. But if you're an employer and you really need to hire, here's the good news. ZipRecruiter has smart tools and features that help you find more qualified candidates fast. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash James, J-A-M-E-S. ZipRecruiter's tools and features help you find the best people for your roles. Here's what happens. You post your job, the manager who's doing the hiring posts their job, and ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology scours like every site on the internet and shows you the candidates whose skills and experience match the job. And you could use ZipRecruiter's invite to apply feature, just a single button. You could send all the top candidates a personalized invite to encourage them to respond to your job post. I actually tried ZipRecruiter as a potential employee and filled out all the forms and blah, blah, blah. I still get emails to this day, really fascinating jobs where people, they want me to uh, go for an interview. Now, I just wanted to experience what the ZipRecruiter experience was like, but it's really fascinating. I wish I had used it when I was younger. And I wish I had used it as an entrepreneur when I was first hiring people for my first several businesses. Let ZipRecruiter help you conquer the biggest hiring challenge, finding qualified candidates. See why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to this exclusive web address right now and try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash James. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash James. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now is the time to accelerate innovation. T-Mobile for Business is powering Formula One Las Vegas Grand Prix operations and epic fan experiences with secure, reliable 5G connectivity. Because an event this big and this fast deserves a network that can set the pace. See what our 5G advanced network solutions can do for your business at T-Mobile.com slash now. View 5G device coverage and access details at T-Mobile.com. you know, I'm always just fascinated again with, with thrillers. Like there are two areas that seem like really difficult to write. One is a chase scene because they, it's hard not to imagine them in a cliched way. Like, Oh, we're chasing them. They start firing at us. We fire back <laughs> yeah, and yeah. something happens like that. There needs to be a twist to get them or else it's a cliche. Yeah, and yeah. then, and then again, building in the, the twist so that only, you know, what's happening and the readers don't know what's happening. And maybe you don't think about it when you're writing, but I'm just fascinated. Like if you have any insight into how you I, do those two things. I try to evolve it in a, in a logical way. So there's not an, oh, all of a sudden epiphany. I, it's, it's pacing. It, it, that's the key is learning how to pace, which took me a long time to learn. How to pace it. So it's, I hate to use the word, but organic or natural. So it's sequential rather than all of a sudden, oh yeah, I looked at a red bird and it made sense sense to me. It, that's that's the skill in in doing these stories, and that's why I spent as much time planning it as actually doing it. And uh, it, it it always seems to come when it always seems to fall into place. 
I, I, it's almost a magical experience where you don't know whether you can do it and then you do it. What, what, what's an example yeah. from like an, er, not necessarily this novel, but like an earlier novel where you feel comfortable saying what the twist is or how you thought about the twist. Like as you were outlining, like how did you think about the twist and, and you knew it was a, a good twist? I don't even think, think of my books as having twists because I, I just think it's a more gradual, logical, similar psychology where you're meeting, as you very adroitly said, very acutely, you getting to meet people and you have to figure them out. You know, if, I, if a child would come into my office with a symptom, that same symptom could be due to many different things. So you have to learn about this person. And it, it's, it's just, it's, it's not a really a twist. It, I don't know how to explain it. I, I see. It's like, as you're getting to know the different characters better, as their yeah. motivations come out, suddenly yeah. you could begin to connect dots. Dots well, that were very hazy at first, but now they get darker. Well, it's not just that, like the book that I'm outlining now, I know this is a, a really a why done it. The, it's all about motive. The, the whole mystery of this book is why do these things happen? Once we understand why they happen, then we can move on to solving the crimes. And that's true of most of my books, but especially in this particular book that I'm outlining now. And I was working on right before we began talking. And I knew I wanted to get there. And, you know, I just kept thinking about it and writing it and trying different things till I, I got somewhere that made sense to me. Uh, it's, it's the way it is in real life detective work. They keep accruing data until something makes sense. Uh, and sometimes it never happens. You have a cold case. So it's just a matter of collecting. It's like anything else, collecting the information, knowing how to get the information and trying to hone it, trying to sculpt it. I don't know, like, like when I paint, I like to refine. You know, when I paint, I'm sure most painters do, I start off with I frame it out. I'll do a rough out, you know, let's see it's a bird on a, a bird on a branch, a hummingbird. So I sketch it and I write it and I block it in. And and most painting, you start off with dark colors first, then you lighten up. That's not always, but that's and you know, you're using progressively finer brushes. You're starting off with broad brushes, literally, and you're putting it, and then you're getting into the tail, and I use brushes with three hairs on them, and I'm looking at a hummingbird's eyeball and that kind of thing. Same thing with a novel. You're just zeroing in on a target to some extent. Uh, but and, I, I, for me, it's all about planning, you know? And, and how do you, like, you know, you have this very successful series revolving around Alex Delaware, the child psychologist and yeah. who likes to find, you know, solve crimes. What's the, is there a pressure of like, you know, having to do a series? Like, you know, you're, you're, it's not that you're obligated to write 20 more Alex Delaware novels, but What's different about, you know, sticking to a series for as many novels as you have, um, as opposed to Again, like writing one-offs? I like the one-offs. I don't do them anymore because I don't want to work that hard anymore. I was doing two, three books a year occasionally. They were really inspired. I thought so. They were some of my best books and they just don't sell as well as the others. So if I'm going to spend energy, let me do what people want. But Unlike other writers who got like, I think Conan Doyle got sick of Sherlock Holmes. He killed him off from bottom back. Chandler was always bitching because he was just that kind of a guy. I liked, I like writing Delaware novels because I see them as a vehicle for telling a certain type of story. And my story comes out of my work as a psychologist. It's basically you forget about the past at your own jeopardy. Okay. And and so that's a very psychological approach. I the past is going to come back to. You can't forget about the past. You have to look at the past to understand the present and hopefully the future. So it, it, I keep telling that kind of story using him as a vehicle. It's, it reminds me of the evolution, let's say, of a stand-up comedian, like yeah. where at first they start, start early in their career, like let's take Louis C.K. as an example for better yeah. or for worse. Early in their career, he was just, he was like uh, an absurdist. He was just telling these like crazy jokes and they were great. He right. was funny, he had talent right. and right. skill. But then he really became huge when he started talking about his own failures and his own life and the crazy things that happened to him with his kids and marriage and stuff like that. So you, it's like you were able to, once you put yourself in the fiction, exactly. you, you, it, it, it took off. I mean, it was taking off before then with even right from your first book, but then this became a series, this Alex Delaware series. Well, it got, it got published. I got published because I was finally stopped being a coward. I would write about everything but being a psychologist. 
There were two reasons. First of all, I hadn't been a psychologist that that long. I mean, I got my doctorate in 74. The book was published 11 years later. But I wrote it in 1981. So you have to accrue a certain amount of, of experience. Like, even though I went a literary work when I was 21, I had nothing to say. I had nothing to say. No life experiences. Were, were uh, girls impressed that you won a literary award when you were 21? Sure. That's, how do you think I got married? <laughs> I knew you it. Know, you know, I mean, I mean, girls were impressed by playing guitar, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever works. But it, it was just, um, I never thought this was going to be a series. I didn't, you never know. My wife says it, Faye, Faye, Faye says it, she goes, you never know your first novel. It's your first novel. So you throw everything in there. And then you've established these characters and you have to be consistent. But I don't feel hemmed in by him. I it, honestly, at this point, if I didn't want to do it, I wouldn't do it. Because life is too short. I'll be 75 this summer. I want, I like to enjoy my life, you know? And I just like writing books. Well, first off, for anyone who's listening to this and not watching this, you yeah. look very young for 75. So I can tell the good the good genes. <laughs> I can see you why your mom lived to 103. Yeah, people think I look younger. I don't you, know look young, you look young too, by the uh, way. I'm 55, so I'm 20 years 20 younger. 20 years younger. <laughs> 20 years younger. And I, 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 I don't know if I want to live to 103. I mean, she was okay to 96. So it wasn't bad. But All right, that's a good, good run. She, she had a good life. No, I mean, you, you like to think, you have to have a somewhat young approach also to write. I, I don't want to, I'm not writing for Gen Xers. I'm not writing about TikTok. So yeah, my readership has aged to some extent. Uh, I, I'm I'm just not that young, hip, new, fresh phenom guy anymore, which I was in 1985. But but two questions about that. Like one is is the phenom concept. So like in the late 80s, early 90s, there was the so-called Brat Pack of fiction with Jay yeah. McInerney, Brett Easton yeah. Ellis, and Tama Janowitz, yeah. and they were yeah. all young. Like Brett Easton Ellis yeah. was like 21 when he first published. Right, and and it was it was just like. With entrepreneurship, there's this myth that the young ones are more brilliant, but there's been a lot of research to show that writers actually get better. Like a historian, a, a mathematician, their peak age is 25. But Correct. a historian, according to Arthur Brooks, the peak age is 69 years old for a historian. Like they should try to live into their 70s because yeah. <laughs> their best work's going to happen yeah. around then. And for yeah, writers, I, I think it's the same. I mean, you can be a flash in a pan or you can be... A, I was about the same age as Jay McInerney. We broke it around the same time. But in, in typical fashion, all those guys, and I, mean, I think they're talented, they were just part of that New York hipster thing. And I'm married and living in a suburb with my wife and kids, not living a glamorous life, going to work. And that's my style. And that's face style too. We like to keep a low profile. I'm not interested in going to parties. Never hired a publicist. I'm really bad at self-promoting. I don't want to talk about the new book. I, I never like talking about a specific book. I like talking about the process, the way we're talking. That's much more interesting to you. I'm a terrible self-promoter. And it, it, but but pub uh, publishers now only are interested in self-promotion. I don't know if that always was always were, the case. They, they always were. But always but were. like how did you I guess, like you said, it was word of mouth on that first book. Your published fortunately, in some respects, you were below the radar for your publisher, so they weren't pressuring yeah. you. And yeah. word of mouth got that first bestseller status. Yeah, I got, as I say, I got a lot of attention because Sh Shrink writes book. And I was like the only guy doing that out there. And I was a real shrink. You know, Michael Crichton was an MD, but he never practiced medicine. He, he's a, he was a great writer, but he, he never practiced medicine. And, uh, but I did, I practiced psych. And, and so I, I was doing, I had another uh, life. And so that was, I got a lot of attention. I got on the Today Show and then I got really good reviews. Um, and then I won an Edgar Award. So it was like, wow, this is cool. So, but I, you know, it, I never took it seriously to the extent that I was willing to give up my day job till six years later. Uh, I, I'm just very conservative by nature. And uh, whether, it, whether it comes to investing or anything else, and as a result, we're doing very well. So, you know, um, it, it's just personality. I don't... I don't use drugs. I'm not a heavy drinker. I don't, have a, I, just, I don't have a lot of vices. I'm a pretty boring guy who's able to write books. That's just the way it is. And there are, there are other people who are like that. I think when you start to live, you're not, that happened to Norman Mailer. Here's Norman Mailer, who's a genius, right? When he became 
running for mayor of New York and becoming a persona. He never wrote another novel again. Yeah, it's, 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 it's true. I mean, he did, but they weren't known really. Like, well, he uh, wrote nonfiction fiction stuff. Yes. You know, they weren't really yeah. serious novels like Naked and the Dead. That was a, a brilliant work. You can't do both. You can't you know, do both. You know, I, I, I think it was his, his, you know, a lot of people, their second book after a great first book is not as good. So I think he had trouble with his second book, but his third book, which was, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Um, my memory's bad. Uh, the American dream, I think it was called, uh, yeah. And American dream. I loved that book. It's one of my all time. Yeah, brilliant. Books. It was brilliant. But later on he became Norman Mailer instead of being a guy named Norman Mailer who wrote books very yeah. well. He wanted to be in the post on page six. He wanted to be in the New York Times. He wanted to be a celebrity. He wanted to hang around with people. Doesn't appeal to me at all. Some of those people were my patients. I don't want to hang out with them. So, you know. So, like, how? So, Faye, your wife, she's also like an impressive novelist yeah. and sold yeah. tons of copies and has her own yeah. series. Yeah. How much do you guys kind of grew up together in, in, in writing? Well, that's the thing. We didn't meet through the English department. I have a doctor in psych. She has a degree in dentistry. She's a dentist. She never practiced. She has a degree in theoretical math. She's a genius, okay? She's like math, physics, brilliant, uh, you know, really, really smart. Was going to go to med school, but she said, I want to have kids. So I'll go to dental school. Hated it, never practiced. I had no idea that she could write because my concept was i'm i'm the writing artistic guy in the family you're the math science person kind of a reversal in terms of sex roles so i would go to the office and she decided to write a book and i had just gotten i just sold when the bow it was 85 and i was sitting with our third child who was born in 85 on my shoulder she was a baby and faye comes up to me and hands me this sheaf of paper says read this it's lousy you'll hate it and I, and i go oh shit this is a tough position to be in, you know. We knew each other for 12 or 13 years. We, we, we'd been married for many years. And I start reading it. This is like really good. I said, I can't believe she has any talent. I you think you know somebody, you've been, you've been with them for years and you don't know them. And I'm going, honey, this is really good. So then she said, I was, I was patronizing her. So we had a little tip about that. I said, no. So I called my agent. Now you need to understand, I had no clout. My first book hadn't even come out. I just sold it. For, for very little money. I said, I know what it sounds like. I wrote it, but he said his eyes rolled back in his head. He said, I'll, I'll read it. He reads it, he goes, she's a writer. And he sells it right away. Were you jealous? Because you spent like no, a decade? No, I was so happy for her because she was miserable because she went to dental school, she graduated, and then she had a kid. And she said, okay, when Jesse's a little older, I'll go back to work. Then she decided, I'll have another kid. And so she had a couple of little kids and she was like, how old was Faye? Like 31, 32. And she was bored. She was, that's why she started out. She was really bored and unhappy because here's this brilliant person who, who could have done anything, really. She's just a genius. And, and I was so happy that, but I struggled for 13 years, but the, every, every novel's been a bestseller, okay? Every single book from, the, from Faye got published right away, but it took her many, many books like P.D. James to become a bestseller. So she had a different, you know, different uh, arc, so to speak. Right. Um, but I was, it's a bizarre story because I think we're the, we're the only married couple to be on the New York Times list at the same time. Now, to, to, tell, to be honest, Faye has just retired. She had enough of it. Doesn't want to do it anymore. She went out on top. I said, you don't miss it at all. She goes, nope, nope. So it works out. She picks up the grandkids from, uh, from school. She cooks a little bit. She, she's learning Hebrew, she's boning up on her French, and she's just enjoying her life, you know? So, let me ask you, like, when you're working a really high-intense job like you were and yeah. dealing with kids with cancer and yeah. all this stuff, and then you're writing in the garage at night, uh, how did you guys keep it together? Not necessarily the <laughs> marriage, but or, or maybe the marriage. Like, how, yeah. what, what sort of problems existed at that time? Well, the big problems were having kids and not sleeping like everyone else. I, I mean, uh, I, I think the problem was that Faye was not so happy with her life because, you know, and I had done everything. I, I was, one thing I never was, was a sexist. I always said, God, you're really smart. You need to do something, you know, whatever you want, you know. 
And I supported her, whatever she wanted to do. I, I paid her tuition all through dental school, you know. And um, and I was I was kind of sad that she wasn't happier with the way things were going. But, but overall, we were happy. We had a good marriage. We're best friends. We've been together for 53 years. You know, we love each other. And um, and we had kids. And what I would do is I'd work at Children's Hospital, or in that case, in private practice, come home. When I was in practice, my hours were not as long because I, I didn't want to work that hard. I, I wanted time to relax, and I was making a lot more money. So I would come home, be with the kids, be with Faye, hang out. She would go to bed. And then I'd go out to the garage, 11 p.m., 2 a.m., and, and, and work on my writing. So it didn't intrude. Uh, and she was always very encouraging. Like, like when I told her I was quitting the hospital, to, I actually asked her permission. I said, can I quit the hospital and then could we tighten our belt for you? She goes, sure, honey, whatever you want. She didn't care about money. Faye doesn't care about stuff. She's from the Midwest. She's a very sensible person. And, and you know, she grew up in California, but she's, she was born in St. Louis and she's from the Midwest. And I think it's the reason our kids turned out so, so well. She's like a really stable, unpretentious. She's, here's, here's a woman who looked like a movie star, has a doctorate has written bestsellers, and she's so unpretentious. How did you get so lucky? lucky? You know, it, it really is luck. I, I, when I saw Faye, I came, it, it was a sports night from a Jewish college group. And I had just finished with the requisite psychotic girlfriend, right? <laughs> I wasn't right. interested in another girlfriend. And, I, and a bunch of guys are standing around, and they go, who's that? I said, what are they looking at? They go, oh, there's a new girl. And there was Faye. It was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. I said, she's really cute, but she looks 14 years old. You think I look young, you should see her. They said, no, she's 18. I said, okay. <laughs> so I made my move and game on. And game on. And and that was it from the day we met. It was like, uh, I won't say love at first sight, but certainly love at second sight. We just have a really good rapport. It's not to say we don't have our tiffs, we don't have our fights. We don't, you know, both of us are very strong personalities. Uh there's 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 no dominant submissive, there's two dominants in this family. So you have to learn how to compromise, uh, but she's just awesome. And and as we've gotten older, right, it's a different depth of love uh, because you really start to appreciate that you've been with this person your entire life. I mean, we, I always say to the extent that I grew up, I grew up with Faye. And mm -hmm. so I was 21 when I met her. When we were 19 and 22. We decided we're getting married, which is pretty crazy in retrospect. And we looked 14 and 17 and people try to sell us credit schemes. If you, see, if you see our wedding picture, we look like children. And uh, it was just one of those lucky deals. But in the, in the uh, traditional Jewish background we came from, all of our friends were getting married young. I, I have another friend, his wife was 18, another was 17, another one was 20. So we were not the only ones. That was our social norm in that community. And all those people are still married. They're still married. And they're happily married and have a bunch of kids. It's just what we grew up with. That's amazing. So... Yeah. And you guys have two kids who also happen to be writers. Yeah, like two writers and two psychologists. Like and two oh, psychologists. So two middle daughters are PhDs in psychology. So oh, that's it's interesting. It's, and we never, we never, we were not helicopter parents. You know, I sent, I paid tuition at four Ivy League type schools. Uh, I, one kid went to Harvard, one kid went to Penn, one kid went to Barnard, one went to Claremont McKenna, all pretty exclusive. We never told them where to go. We never made the decision. We didn't care. Frankly, I think it's a lot of it's a lot of hooey. I think uh, yeah. in recent events at Harvard, it's all Emperor's clothing. It's, you know, I mean, it's a college like anything else, and and you can get a good education anywhere. So, uh, but we didn't. We just didn't. The kids turned out well because of Faye. I'll give you a good example. We had an assistant, a prior assistant before Jane. She was British, and her prior boss had been Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> And which something she was never, ever going to let us forget. She was always talking about, oh, Bruce, oh, Bruce. But one thing she said to Faye, Faye, you're the only boss I've ever had who cooks. <laughs> you know, Faye would get up in the morning and make sure the kids had breakfast and she would drive them to school. And I got to be honest. I said, honey, it was up to me. I hire a driver and it's a delegate. No, nope, no, nope. it's there for the kids. As a result, we have a son of three daughters. They love her, especially these have daughters. They call her every day. They love her, and and they're just really close to her, and they appreciate her. And we have a dozen grandkids so so far, and uh, it's a huge clan of people. So, where, where would you say her writing is better than yours? She's definitely started out with better dialogue, no huh. question. 
I mean, she, uh, Elmer Leonard and Faye were the best, best dialect people. She has a good ear. She's very, like, I'm a painter, so I'm very visual. She was very good at, like, she could uh, do impressions of people. She had a really good, good ear. And I, I, I did learn from her about that. She's also a, kind of a cut and dry type of person. So she, there's no bullshit in her book. She just tells, tells the story. But honestly, we had very little interplay. We've actually written a few novellas together, and that was a pleasant experience. But not something we wanted to do again because we were busy. Uh, so it's not that we talk shop. I mean, we just did our own thing. I mean, the only privacy we ever had was writing our books. We used to say, because think about it, we shared everything else, but we go to our office, we'd write our books. Now, the, the process has changed. In the early days, we were insecure. Every Friday, we would show each other our week's work. So we had a little writer's group. That well, was like date night for you. Uh, yeah, no, except sometimes, as Faye said, there were some cold nights. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be really ginger. As our confidence grew, it stretched out. And it got to the point fairly quickly where we just showed each other finished books, finished manuscripts. And for the most part, once in a while, we'd make a suggestion here and there. I always welcome her suggestion because she's a writer and she's a talented person. But for the most part, it's a you know, mutual admiration club. And she's going, oh, yeah, it's great. I, 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 and I'm saying, really? So for the most part, and people would say, do you compete? And Faye, was, her answer was, it all goes in the same bank account. So it's funny how you have a very practical, like obviously sure. when you were first writing, you did yeah. it. I don't want to say you did it then for the love of it and you don't do it now, but you've repeated several times that you, it's a job also. Yeah. But back yeah. then it wasn't a job. So you were a hundred percent doing it for the love. Right. And I wonder if now that you're in part doing it and getting paid for it, like, and again, you referred to Parker's quote about the contract and, yeah. and, and so on. I wonder if that's why, do you think you paint more because that's like a more artistic outlet for you now that you're not paid for? No, I always paint it, always play guitar. Those are two of the things that I've done my whole life. I'm just, you know, I think I'm a, actually a better painter than I am a writer. I was kind of a child prodigy. I could paint upside down. I could paint with both oh. hands. Just something that I can do. And I can't, I can't explain it. Um, but no, I, and just the fact that it's a job doesn't mean I love it even more. So I don't have to worry about it now. Uh, right. it's, it just, it became a job in 1990, a full-time job. And when I say it's a job, it's not to say that it's boring or it's pedestrian. It's just that we like, those of us who've been doing it for decades, I have found we approach it in a professional manner. It's not an inspiration. Yes, we're inspired all the time. We're creative. But it's not a, you know, all of a sudden an epiphany comes. It's a matter of thinking it through and taking it. Writing a novel, as you know, you write a book, it's a long project. We were with some, we were with a project for uh, several years ago. There was like a genius camp for, for these kids. Uh, and, and they asked us to be the writers in residence there. And, and Faye, being a math person, she was talking to these kids, and most of them were math geniuses. And she said, what's the longest problem you've ever worked on? She said, because, you know, if you're in math, some of these problems can take a long time. And she was trying to get to get across to them that some of these projects take a long time. And I yeah. think that's, that's what it is, you know. Particularly when you're talking about the scope of a career. Like, yeah. like it took you a decade to get stuff published. Then it took yeah. you, you know, probably, you know, I don't know when the first, when did the first Alex Delaware book come, come out? 85. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Right. This is the, the first one. So, yeah. uh, you know, you, you hit your stride with the series, but it's a long process. You, you can't, you in something, so, sometimes you feel like giving up on things. Like let's say someone wants to be a professional athlete. It's so easy to give up in that first couple of rejections or, you know, a professional, anything really, particularly if it's more sensational or artistic, because everyone wants those to do that for of their course. life. I, I think being a best-selling novelist, it, it, there's a lack of reality. It's like being a major league pitcher or being a movie star. I never had thought that was in my life. And you can't aspire to that. I mean, you can, but I don't know. It's, it's just, it's, look, people tell me, oh, well, you deserve it. Because 
I don't believe in deservedness, okay? Yeah, I think I'm a pretty talented guy and I work hard. But I can be just as talented and it didn't happen. There's plenty of great sure. writers who don't sell a lot of books and plenty of lousy writers who sell a lot of books. But there are some good writers who sell a lot of books and I would hope I'm in that pantheon, you know? So it's just, there's no guarantees. You understand that. You're a mature human being who's done a lot of stuff. Kids say you don't understand it. You, I, I'll get people come come to me before they write a novel and say, how do I publicize? How do I promote? I've got to write the damn books first, you know? I mean. Right. I think, I think people don't understand that because it's pretty easy in most respects on this, in this country in particular. Yeah. And so you expect everything to be easy. And, it, and it, to some extent, it's getting too easy. I mean, maybe that shows my age a little bit. But <laughs> like, do you... Do you think people read as much? Because let, let's put it this way. Reading is harder than watching TikTok videos. And so people do not read as much. And, and men certainly don't. Most, it's, it, to the extent you have readers, it's mostly women, except if you're a, like a Tom Clancy guy. I, I think it's the internet. You know, the news cycle's gone from 24 hours to 24 seconds. Yeah. And, you do, and you do have people who are like influencers. I gave the keynote address at SE graduation a few years ago because I was on faculty and I'm, I'm an alumnus. And I said, get a real job, don't be an influencer. And, and they all applauded. But the truth is some of these influencers, whatever they are, make a ton of money. Now, it's not gonna last unless they invest properly. They're gonna be like, you know, the rock star who's, who's selling real estate. So it, it, it is a tough thing because we, are, we have conditioned people to have no attention span at all. Right, so how do you, has your writing changed as a result of that? Like, do you get to the murder faster? No, my writing hasn't changed. What I've had to do is adapt to reality. If I, people will point out the, the older books, I'm old enough to have, to have anachronisms. So, you know, pay phones. <laughs> now you have cell phones. You have, and you can't deny things like DNA and all that. So you have to work it in. But if, but if you're skillful, you can work with that, you know? Um, so you have to change reality to some extent, but but the core is the same, and and people don't really change. I used to be on the the media line for SC Med School, which means when reporters had questions on certain topics, they could call call me, and it was always a question like, "How do you think video games are going to change children?" You know, I said they're not going to change at all. Their behavior might might change, but human nature is human nature. It's the same way I feel about race. I clinically I dealt with people from all backgrounds because when you work in a major hospital. No, we had we had uh, gypsies, and they were called gypsies. They were self-labeled as gypsies. I know it's not a politically correct thing. They were gypsies. We had everything. I dealt with people from all backgrounds. And, and I got to learn that ethnicity is a hurdle, but you can get over it. And once you get over that hurdle and you open the communication, everyone's the same. People want the same things. Human beings don't really change nature. Everything around them changes. So kids are kids. I just think we're conditioning people to expect things so quickly. Yeah. But, but maybe kids were always that way. I don't know. You know, Maybe like one thing you hear from each generation is that it'll, it'll never be as good for us as our parents. And that, <laughs> and that never is actually true. Like people no. are saying it now. People said it when I was younger. People probably yeah. said it when the generation before was younger, like the baby boomers were younger. So there's, there's always down periods. Well, I have to make sure I don't lapse into that grumpy old guy, oh, this generation. Yeah, but understand, you know, it's the same process over and over of the young wanting to eat the old. And it's, it's just, you know, things, okay, I'm an optimist. And I'm an optimist because I was born that way. It's character logic, okay? I'm just lucky. I'm lucky and I'm an optimist. I find optimism, pessimists think they're realistic. They're not. If you look right. at pessimists, okay. their error rate is higher. And when you teach pessimists to act like optimists, they're happier. So if you look at the world, when people start bitching about the world, say, you really want to live in, in the medieval ages? You want to live in the days before antibiotics? I said, a working class guy has more creature comforts than the king of England had 200 years ago. The world has gotten better progressively. Well, well and, and your wife will appreciate this. The biggest cause of suicide in the 1800s was dental pain. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> exactly. I mean, people, my mother was lucky. She was born prior to penicillin. So that's why, you know, those were tough people because the weak ones were killed off. Yeah. You, got a, you got strep infection, you died. You died. 
So do you want that with a life expectancy it was 30, 40? I mean, I mean, people always think that their experience is everything. And there's such an inability to look at the way things were. I don't know. So like when you're when you sit down to write, like who do you read? Who who's um do you read do you read beforehand to kind of get the juices flowing or I don't read any fiction because I don't want to steal. I don't want to steal. I don't want to crib. The only time I read fiction is if there's a long stretch in between books. And I find and it's really interesting because people would send me books, books for blurbs, and they'd always try to send me a book like mine, or they thought was like mine. I don't want to read that. That's boring. Right. I want to read something different. I read a lot of nonfiction. I, 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 one thing I bemoan is the, is the death of magazines, good magazines, but there's still a few. I read history. I read science. I read art. Uh, fiction wise, I've been going back and rereading the books of two writers, Margaret Millar. I don't know if you're familiar with no. her. She was married to Ross. Mac- yes. You never heard of her. She was married to Ross McDonald. Okay. His real name was Kenneth Millar. And she's, she's, nasty and dark. I mean, she's really worth reading. Uh, and, and Ruth Rendell, both of whom are dark, dark writers, very, very skillful. Margaret Millar uh, wrote in Santa Barbara and Ruth is British. And so I've been going back and reading quality fiction. But for the most part, I, uh, I read non, nonfiction. I read a lot of science. I, I'm very curious about the world. So almost anything I'm going to read about, if, if it comes my way. You know? I, I guess also nonfiction is more likely to fuel plots than fiction. I guess so. I, it's just like, I don't read fiction because for two reasons. First of all, I read, to enjoy fiction, you have to immerse yourself in it and engage what you call the subjective state of consciousness. And I, I lapse into the, the objective state of a consciousness where I'm reading it like an editor would. I'm going, uh, I would write that differently. Oh, that makes no sense. So something has to be really good to, to get me to be immersed in it. Uh, and, and, and I find it difficult. But I just, I just think nonfiction is more stimulating. I, I, I don't think in terms of getting plots. Uh, in terms of that, I have, a, I have an idea file created years ago because I have no short-term memory anymore because I'm old. And so I have 100 plot ideas in this file, 100-plus plot ideas. I'll never write all of those. So... I don't need new ideas. They're in there. I've got them in there. Interestingly, the book I'm writing now is not in that file. It's something totally different that I came up independently. But getting an idea is not a problem. People always say, oh, I have an idea. I said, then you should write your book. (laughs) Yeah, that process of, like you said, just, you know, or someone said to me recently, again, my short-term memory is no good, but uh, that so-and-so was asked about writer's block and, and he said, uh, every day at 9 a.m. I don't have writer's block. <laughs> so he knows he has to write that and that's what he does. That's your job, exactly. No, it's like it's like saying, I have an idea. The, the jump from idea to book is like, I've got guitar strings on my guitar, so now I'm going to write a song. No, I mean, that's your tool. You have an idea. That's that's the germ. But to get, I'll give you a good example. Warren, Warren Zevon, are you familiar with, yeah. with Warren Zevon? So he was a very good friend of mine. And he was fascinated by this whole process of writing a novel. He said, John, I write a song in three minutes and I'm finished. And I have nothing to do all day. <laughs> and you take a whole year. So he was so happy when he got the gig to be the band leader on David Letterman because he got to put on a suit and have a real job. Uh, Unfortunately, he passed yeah. away shortly after, but but we were always talking about the difference between writing songs and writing novels. It's very, very different. Yeah, because you have to, like you say, you have to immerse yourself in those characters. You have to live with those characters in yeah. your head for a year or more. Forever, forever, in my case, because it's a series. So I have to yeah. live with these guys forever. I mean, it's, it's so strange. These imaginary people have been a bigger part of my life than anyone except my family. Do you, want, just, a t- do you want a TV series? Do I want a TV series? Yeah, like there's, you know, there's done, Reacher, there, there's other. If it's done well, we've tried, you know, so, so many times we've had so many deals fall through. Uh, we've had people try to do the books. They're not concept-based, what Hollywood calls high concept, like a Michael Crichton book, you know, Dinosaurs in Amber. You can't sum my books up. They're even hard to write flap copy for because it's not based, as you say, upon a twist or anything. They're more complex. 
So people really find it difficult to, uh, to do. I've had so many deals, so many deals that fell through, so many bad scripts writing. Uh, at this point, I don't pursue it. I don't really care. If someone does a great job, but I'd rather not do it than someone do a crap job. And now with all the pol political critics, I don't want someone saying, I want Milo to be a black autistic woman. No, it's yeah. not gonna, you know, we have to, we have to stick to the, to the book the way it yeah. is. And I'm not sure that would play today. We'll see. Well, you know, again, a great series of books, the ghost orchid. It's just, I, you say you don't, you don't have the classic twist and that, and that's true, <laughs> but I was just riveted in full each time. And, um, I appreciate uh, it. Jay. It's, it's I can really pull great. You, I can fool anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty open to just living in that world when I read the book yeah. and, yeah. and letting the writer guide me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, maybe that's why I never really liked Agatha Christie. Cause I'm not really trying to figure it out, but I just enjoy it. And Thanks. And I really enjoy your stuff. I'm so glad uh, you came on the podcast. And it's 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 thrilling to talk to a, a thriller writer like like yourself. It's such a great one. So thank you once again for coming on the show. And the book, as I mentioned earlier, was is the Ghost Orchid, an Alex Delaware novel. And go out and buy it. What's what date does it actually come out? I think February sixth. Okay. I'm not sure. Early yeah. February. See, I don't yeah. even pay. I don't even pay attention to that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you're it's hard to work outlining the next one. Exactly. It's great meeting you and great talking to you. And I, I really appreciate the insights. So, yeah, thank you. I appreciate the, your insights. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, James. Take care. In a fast-paced world, Every day brings new challenges and new opportunities. At Strayer University, we know a thing or two about getting and staying ahead of change. For over 130 years, we've been providing students like you with innovative tools, customized support, and an education built to empower you. So you can find your way forward and always keep striving. Visit strayer.edu to learn more. Have you ever spotted McDonald's hot? crispy fries right as they're being scooped into the carton and time just stands still Ba-da-ba-ba-ba -ba -ba.